Hi, I'm Sarah Marie Johnson, the Executive Director of Millbrae Community Television. The goals of MCTV as an organization are to provide inclusive viewpoints and amplify voices of all community members. The views expressed on this episode of Take Notice do not necessarily reflect the views of MCTV as an organization. Earlier this month, MCTV worked together with community activists to live stream a Black Lives Matter march and vigil right here on the steps of Millbrae City Hall. We're proud of this work and the community partnerships that we're developing with grassroots movements at a local level. We want to thank the independent producers of Take Notice for providing a platform for an official viewpoint from the San Mateo Sheriff's Office on the important issues of race and policing that face our city, state, and nation today. However, his is only one of many voices that need to be heard as we move forward to do better as a society. Sadness and outrage united hundreds of thousands of people all across the United States in the wake of the death of George Floyd under the knee of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Locally, the outcry that Black Lives Matter brought discussion of all racism to the surface and sparked demonstrations in the cities around San Mateo County. I'm Dan Lawson and you're watching Take Notice. Today we welcome back San Mateo County Sheriff Carlos Bolanos to talk about issues of race and policing, plus the increasing community clamor to have more say in the funding and policies of law enforcement. So good to have you back, Sheriff. It's Thanks good for to being be back, here. Dan. Thank you. So our first question, um, does our community have any say in the operations of the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office? Absolutely. I mean, we, we work tirelessly to build relationships with all of the communities that we serve. And um, as you know, we also, we also are responsible for all of the correctional facilities. And we have many avenues for people to call us and tell us in real time uh, issues that they see, complaints that they have, um, uh, people that they want to commend. Um, I believe that there are many opportunities for people to communicate with us and tell us uh, what they'd like to see from their sheriff's office. Right. At this time, do you incorporate community advisory boards in your community policing efforts? Um, you know, we really, we really don't. And, and the reason is we have so many communities and they are all so different that it becomes, uh, becomes very difficult to have uh, one advisory board that would address the needs across all of the areas that we serve. But, you know, we, for the communities that we do serve, um, our police chiefs uh, report to a uh, city manager who reports to a city council uh, who reports to the members of the community. So uh, I believe that our city councils and the elected boards um, are, are the um, uh, advisory board uh, to the local uh, sheriff's offices. So do you have any direct contact with the black community and other communities of color regarding concerns of use of force? Uh, we, are, we have an open, open door relationship. Um, we in San Mateo County uh, probably don't have uh, as many um, of those types of organizations. We have, the, uh, uh, we have a local NAACP um, and uh, you know, they're very active primarily in the mid county area. But uh, we, as always, we, we know each other. And uh, as I said, uh, we're always open to speaking with anyone who has a concern. Great. Now, I know a, a year or so ago that there was an incident in Millbrae with a black male. Um, do you know what the status is on, the, on that? I do. As you know, the uh, district attorney determined that uh, there was no criminal, um, criminal behavior on the parts of the deputy sheriffs involved. Uh, we determined that there were no policy violations, and it is now in the uh, litigation stage. But I also want to say how tragic is it when um, anyone loses their life uh, uh, in a situation like that? And uh, but I think you know it's going to be determined uh, through the legal system uh, in regards to whether uh, they determine that our folks did anything wrong. 
the community is more active, more concerned, more mobilized than we have seen in years. I saw that recently um, your office did reach out several times in the last few weeks to the community. Can you explain uh, you know, what you said to them? Sure. So um, I said a couple things to them. Uh, number one, that you know we are we are their law enforcement um, uh, sheriff's office in the county. Uh, many of them have their own police department, and uh, just that we we recognize uh, the tragic situation which occurred in Minneapolis, um, you know, and and how important it is that you know all of law enforcement not be tarnished by the acts of a few, and. Many people are asking questions about, you know, our policies. Um, and so we're sharing our policies with them, which we had recently uh, recently uh, updated with the assistance of the uh, ACLU. Um, I believe they're, they're some of the most progressive uh, use of force policies in the nation. We have um, uh, obtained much new equipment uh, of a less lethal uh, type to really try to um, you know, de-escalate situations and really try to minimize the use of force um, with the with our community members. Great. Our viewers may be interested in some of those um, those methods or those new no uh, weapons that possibly that you used or, or devices. Sure. Well, uh, we have uh, we've equipped all of our cars with the uh, automated external defibrillators, so that if somebody we encounter goes into a um, into a you know physical or medical crisis, we can administer aid immediately. We've uh, e equipped everybody in our uh, everybody in the field and everybody in our correctional facilities with body cameras. We've always had the in-vehicle cameras. We purchased um, uh, 40 millimeter uh, uh, launchers, which uh, are one more uh, step before deadly force. They shoot a rubberized projectile. We, um, what else did we do? Uh, we purchased all brand new tasers, which are, uh, have many new uh, capabilities that I believe uh, enhance the safety of their use for both my personnel and uh, those uh, individuals whom we may have to use them on. Um, I think that's it. Uh, we, also, uh, we also increased our psychological emergency response team, which deals with people who are suffering from a mental health crisis uh, to really try to de-escalate the situation uh, and resolve it without uh, any use of force. Right. And that's, I think that's a, a, a good point you just made and a good segue into the next question, which is, has there been any thought about re-envisioning the role of law enforcement in San Mateo? You mentioned yeah. the, like a social worker or, you know, a medical worker that, uh, uh, mental health worker, I should say, that could help with some of these sure. issues. Well, that's a great question. And, you know, that really speaks to the whole uh, uh, defunding the police, um, um, you know, question that that uh, that arose immediately after the Minneapolis uh, incident. I think people recognize that they don't want to defund their police. What they want to do is have their police focus on certain things and perhaps bring in um, mental health professionals or or social workers to address uh, the other issues. That's, that's a great topic because. You know, law enforcement, as you know, has become the uh, solve all. We get called for everything, and then we're being asked to solve everything and be coaches, be, you know, read to the kids at the library, um, feed the poor, enforce the law, you know, on and on and on. So this concept of, you know, defunding, which it started out as, is now being reimagining, and I think you used a new word that I hadn't heard before, um, you know, and I just hope that, um, you know, society and the communities really, really think this through and, and, and make the best decision as to what is best for their public safety. And, uh, you know, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what our elected officials um, want us to do. You know, what do you want us to do? And um, so that, that's right. my... It yeah, I'd like to reinforce that point that you made that uh, it's so, so often some of these social issues are given to law enforcement to try to solve and, and uh, it really is a community issue. For example, homelessness, mental health issues, 
drug addiction. These are all things that we have to become involved in as, as law enforcement officers, and it is, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I welcome uh, you know, some further discussions about um, these types of issues, and uh, I worry about, I mean, if you take money away from law enforcement and you give it to social workers, uh, mental health clinicians, uh, homeless advocates, is that really going to lessen the load or the reliance on law enforcement? Because we're out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I wouldn't want to be a social worker out there 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week, dealing with issues after hours. And I think the reliance on law enforcement will remain the same. When, thing goes, when things go bad, who are they going to call? Us. Last question, Sheriff. Is racism a law enforcement issue? It is a law enforcement issue only as, it, um, only as we understand that law enforcement is but a small slice of society at large. Racism has been, has been a horrible thing that has existed in our country uh, almost since its inception and, uh, and worldwide. And uh, is it an issue in San Mateo County? Absolutely. Is it an issue in law enforcement? Yeah, I think it is. Um, but it's not a law enforcement issue. Racism is a societal issue that exists in all of our institutions, in everything that we do. And I, uh, where I resist is uh, having it be tied to law enforcement because I don't think that's ever gonna solve the issue. It, it, the only way it's gonna solve the issue is w if we all understand that we are all part of the problem and then we all need to be part of that solution. And I think uh, many of the folks, I mean, you know, blaming the police is always easy, right? We're out there, we're visible. Uh, you know, we have to do things that other people don't ever want to do. And part of that involves uh, danger. It involves people getting hurt. Um, and that's unfortunate. But our communities need us out there keeping them safe. And I think what I'm seeing is a, uh, is a, a change where, you know, many folks started coming out and saying the police were the problem. And, you know, I was having lunch today and I was approached by four different people who thanked me because I was in uniform, not because they all know who I am. Um, uh, and thank me and, and my colleagues for the work that we do. Um, can we improve? Absolutely. And I think we have to be part of the, of the solution, but to point as us as the only part of the problem, uh, will not solve the larger problem of racism uh, in our communities and in our society. It certainly will need to be a united effort. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chair, for this open dialogue and your very thoughtful responses. Thank you, Dan. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, uh, to come on your show. Thank you. From the killing of unarmed blacks to the federal assault on the Hispanic workforce, and to the unwarranted pandemic hate speech against Chinese citizens, each of us has seen or heard of racial bias in our own neighborhoods. Having almost 50 years of law enforcement experience, I acknowledge the role law enforcement institutions in the U.S. have played in the perpetuation of explicit and implicit racism that has denied people of color in our communities fair and impartial justice. I am, however, encouraged that the most recent calls for justice will bring our communities together to find solutions because every small step away from racism is a step towards peace and safety for all of our children and grandchildren. Thank you for watching NCTV's Take Notice. Please like and share our program. And most importantly, stay safe.